anytime that my opponent indicates that they're a weaker player, I'm probably going to try to play hand for hand type ranges. Um, and then uh, you're going to see me play a mixed strategy on every spot that I should play a mixed strategy on. So, so you'll see a lot, a lot of different things here. I'm also going to spend, because I'm only going to be two tabling, spending a lot of time on timing tells and just kind of getting a feel for this. Uh, because the SPR is so low, I need to be basically defending top and, you know, like second pair plus, so an 8x hand or better will just go in here. Easy game. I'm just bet really, really small to just in induce, you know, obviously my hand is never, you know, never going away there. So immediately going to say this guy's a, a probably on the recreational side, so... Gonna try my to play my hand very uh, uh, against his exact hand. Uh, not the best flop here. He should not be very eight x heavy, so I think I'm still allowed to bet like half pot on like seven seven six six eight eight gets a little bit close. But again, he should not have too many hands that are like raised call uh, with eight eights here. Uh, don't block. I mean, now I unfortunately block all of his folding range. So I'm mean, gonna I block some of it on the flop after my range bet. So I'm just gonna give this this one up. But yeah, the the benefit of playing two tables is that I can focus a lot on my opponent's uh, actual bet sizings, um, their timing and stuff like that, and really kind of just just beat them up over that. Right, so. Can also just try to push three bets really, really hard and possibly a little bit more than I should from a theoretical perspective, mostly because, you know, I think that I have um, a. Can I see the. You turned off. You muted my TV. Um, I mostly want to play uh, three bet pots with my opponents because I'm just going to be more studied than them and better than them. Uh, Ace three probably should have been an open against this because I'm really trying to just push my. Uh, my preflop advantage. If there's one of the blinds was not full stacked, I'd open that here. Definitely have to open this against this big blind. And you're also going to... I'm probably going to play what's closer to like 200 no limit rake. Mostly, it's just going to be wrong for this stake. I'm just going to eat the rake. Again, because I think that um, I'm going to be able to just beat my opponents up preflop a lot. If this guy had like 80 here, I'd 3-bet here, but doesn't really have enough money. Uh, but also, I just kind of want to demonstrate the, the general mixing style that I play at, at the higher stakes here. Something you're also going to see is that I'm going to be leading my flushes more, uh, mostly because uh, people are just like way too hesitant. They don't see bet enough. Um, they don't like value bet thinly enough. Essentially, there's just too many spots where... You know, like, the river comes, the three flush, and your opponents are, like, checking, like, middle set or something. Or, like, middle two pair. And just, like, all these types of hands. This is actually very close. Um, just a lot of hands that probably should still go for some thin value. Um, just gonna play any two cards here. If the small blind limps, I actually think that raising 7-2 offsuit is probably good. Uh, one, because, I mean, for one, 7-2 offsuit is the kind of hand that really, really... Uh, benefits from the fold equity there. Going to raise into the small blind here. Have to be a little bit cautious because of this button here. Not fantastic. Just going to keep pressing the raise button on, until they go away. Okay, so weaker player calls on the button. Probably just going to start with a check. My hand seems to be able to play well as a check call. Ooh, he pots it here. Actually, just gonna give it to him there. We bet like half pot. Probably would have, probably would have needed a peel there. Very close. Probably, usually, probably either a mix or a fold, depending on the rake structure. But I'm just gonna gas my opponents, especially because they're definitely not gonna be four betting anywhere near enough uh, against me. Yeah, this is still probably a fold against the the three X from the cutoff. But the main adjustment I should be making when my opponents are letting me over realize equity is to um, push my aggression a lot harder in 
in this this street before they're gonna let me realize. So if they're gonna let me just realize too much on the flop, I should three bet them a lot because they're not gonna be four betting enough. So I just get to see way more flops and just kind of evaluate if I want to put in any more money from there. Similarly, if your opponents aren't check raising you enough on the flop, you're incentivized to bet very very widely for a small sizing um, because you're also going to essentially be able to buy uh, two cards worth of equity for like you know a quarter of the pot i bet a quarter of the pot he check he snap checks the turn to me right it's just gonna be really really good uh i don't think that villain's ever gonna bluff here but i have the best hand so i'm just gonna bet real small don't really know what he's calling me with that <laughs> that i uh um beat but i have to have the best hand there probably like a nine maybe eight x or something Uh, but as I was saying, you know, those limpers call all crazy sorts of stuff. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. But as I was saying, if if people are going to be uh, letting me get away with down bets all the time, I mean, one of the reasons why it's so good is that I can just, you know, if I have like third pair, I can just down bet and then get two free cards for super super cheap. And you know, when I have a when I have like a gut shot or a five out draw, I'm gonna get there like 20, 22% of the time, right? So, so much money already in the pot. Really happy to just three bet large. That's slightly sized down because this guy's not full stacked. incentivize the weaker player to play pots out of position against me. Here on this board, I can't have um, twos very often. I can't have very many sixes. So my future, you know, my future equity is not fantastic across a lot of runouts. Obviously, I have, you know, often the best hand. A lot of the times, the hands that uh, I'm ahead of are, like, way behind me. Raising the turn. Yeah, it's probably not that necessary. Raising this river is probably way more necessary. Filling over bets. I guess I'm going to fold here, but I am somewhat suspicious, to be honest. When Villain checks back these um, ace high flops, that they should be playing over better check. They do actually have a lot of showdown uh, type hands. So want to continue to check. He can definitely have like ace five. You know, basically he can have a lot of better trips. Ace Jack here. I'd still three bet against this player who has told me he's a little bit on the weaker end. Usually you only need one, uh, one or two actions that'll look a little bit sus. Even just one sizing that looks a little bit sus and you can kind of figure out what's going on from your opponents. Um, something that's really important, the, uh, I guess the most popular tag I put on my opponents, uh, in terms of like, not popular, but most uh, effective tag that I have on my opponents is BSS, which is equal to bet size is equal to the strength of their hand. And when I have the BSS known on my opponents, um, one, this gives me a lot of leeway to fold whenever they have uh, put in large bet sizes because I just know, oh, that's really representative of a lot of strength. Uh, and then when they bet um, small sizes, that gives me a lot more leeway to put in, you know, uh, bluffs against them. Uh, here I three bet this opponent. Yeah, I probably can keep betting here. We're at this like kind of precarious threshold where he can have like a jamming range on me, which is just a little bit awkward. But, um, what I do like about betting this turn is that Villain can still call me with hands that are worse than mine. Like because these, you know, when you have ace high, and you bet for multiple streets. It's often pretty good because your opponents can. Ugh, that's kind of unfortunate. See, like, you know, <laughs> I think that's kind of an example is that he can be calling me with draws that I actually beat there. So fortunate that he floats me twice.
But again, you know, if if my opponents are playing so horribly, I really need to be getting in there, even with hands as weak as like Ace three, Ace six, right? Just basically anything reasonable against those guys is going to be good. No smoke with aces. Sadness. Probably gonna fold with three bet with this with a seven. Gonna defend almost all of my suited hands here. Probably gonna unfortunately have to call a lot of rivers. Well, yeah, we'll see what he bets. I actually really like playing two tables. <laughs> you uh, you just play so much crispier. I always forget when I'm playing four tables of zone just exactly how much my my game suffers because I'm not uh, not able to pay attention to these kind of like you know small small details in a hand. And so you know when I'm not paying attention to small details because my uh, my mental energy is expended across a lot of different hands, I don't get to do things like 3-bet, you know, king-jack offsuit in position. Right? Because I don't get to express my post-slop edge nearly as much. But here, when I'm playing two tables, I get to just really zone in. Let's start with a check here. A little super snap checks back. He checks back so fast that I just don't think that he's very pair heavy here. Uh, so I don't think there's any real reason to bet very large. Also, I block ace, ace high. Um, I don't think that he should be very 5x heavy here. Um, but I don't think I'm actually going to get value from betting. I do think I get some value from check calling. Oh, he pots the river. I think I still have to call here. Oops. I think there I can mix it so that if I have the ace, I should call there. And if I don't have the ace, because like, just makes him just have a bunch of more random bluffs there. So I think I missed there. Anything smaller than pot, pretty. Uh, for super snaps, yeah. Okay. Having uh, the ace in small blind versus big blind situations is really fantastic because it essentially just increases your opponent's likelihood that they're going to be bluffing significantly. They'll just have like, a lot more like queen jack jack type hands. I mean, it's also probably fine when he pots it on a four flush four straight board. To give it up because that's probably slightly under yeah, for that sizing. That adds, that yeah, yeah, yeah. Really. So to close my eyes and blindly raise here, I think that's. I think this is the best way to play this. Not only do they just like fold here, so I just get to deny them equity, but I'm just gonna run them over in a lot of flops. So, Villain still does limp some aces. Uh, so I, I don't mind checking back here just for a little bit of deception, because obviously these guys play you know extra extra bad facing check too. So. A lot of hands I can get value for two streets now. We we'll start with a small bet here and kind of evaluate. Just thinking about it for a little bit. Okay. I 
I think that's kind of like the icing on the cake is adding or ranging your opponents based on their timing. Um, and obviously, you know, like you can't go too overboard on it, but very often when your opponents, for example, just like snap call you pre-flop, or I'm sorry, snap call, yeah, either like pre-flop or on the flop, they always just have like kind of a medium strength hand, right? Because if they have a fringier type hand, like it's just very close, they stop and think about it, right? So for example, when you're facing like a two-thirds pot size bed and you have like ace-10 with the ace of spades on a two-spade board, or like a nine-high two-spade board, you like at least stop and think. You're like, okay, cool. Like, I, uh, you know, this hand is in the threshold facing X and Y sizing. But when you just like bet and they like super snap call, they always have like, you know, like second pair, pocket pair type hands, right? Like a hand that just never considers raising and never considers folding. Right. So against those guys, you know, very often when you start manifesting gigantic bets, they're going to be really, really unhappy if the board doesn't change. I can play a bunch of different strategies here. I'm going to play a small bet here. Obviously going to want to play a large bet strategy on a board that has, you know, so many gut shots and draws. Uh, Ace-Jack pretty comfortably plays as a bet fold on the turn. This ace should improve my opponent to a lot of, like, pair plus gut shot hands now, so definitely still want to get the value in on the turn. Limp. Nope. I've done some kind of research to see um, when guys size a little bit smaller into your big blind, are they much weaker? And the answer is actually no. So they're either doing it with like a standardized range or they sometimes have some like a little bit of traps. Uh, I didn't make it very large, but I still think this offsuit combination is going to be a little bit too speculative here. I'm just allergic to playing through red pots with offsuit hands, right? Or calling three bed pots, right? I'm very happy to four bet king, queen, ace, queen. Sometimes I just win it here. Not that often. Sometimes I get live rebase, but yeah, like this is this is an amazing feat for me. 150 big blinds per hundred, right? Uh ace the six here is not particularly good. Villain shouldn't be calling with many sixes, so three betting a six, obviously not not fantastic. Uh, here, generally gonna you know, play a bunch of different strategies here. You can mix, have a bunch of checks. I think Villain played that well. Gonna raise targeting this weaker big blind. These games are super soft. We were playing some 200 uh, for some students to watch earlier, and it was equally uh, horrendous. Probably just the full three way heads up. You can think about it. Just going to start with a small range bet here. Really hard to deal with. Villain leads pot. 
when I have the world. I mean, so number one, originally, you know, immediately going to label villain as a, a weaker player. Don't think that when people pot it, they're too weak. You're going to start with a small bet. If this guy bets two thirds on the turn, I guess I'm still going to peel here. I mean, if I had the 10 of hearts, I'd probably fold, but the king of hearts might, it might be just a little bit too good. The problem is there's... The queen of hearts and the jack of hearts are on the board, so, you know, villain's actual calling range there, or, like, what heart he has. <laughs> I mean, it's really hard to actually even put him on, like, what, on, like, a heart there. He can have, like, what, queen nine with the nine of hearts there? Right? So, just... I'm curious what he has, right? Yeah. But, so, wanted to pick a sizing that I thought actually could get... Could get called. Really bad board as this player. Uh, can't let him... I Like, I really don't want to call here and just, like, let him realize this equity. Right? So... If he, like, re-raises there... I mean, I kind of hate things. Um, so I'm going to bet small here and just let my opponent kind of tell me where his hand is. Okay. Because if he just, like, snap, puts in a large raise there, yeah, I can probably assume that he just has it. You know, betting small, calling, and then raising on the, the pairing turn seems very... You know, in line with a fish's mo, right? Like, when you're trying to figure out how to play exploit, a lot of it is thinking, how do my opponents slot their bluffs and and, and value hands into their their different sizings and strategies, right? And so, as as you're kind of like building out that profile, you just get better, better and better at your opponent um, than your opponents. Uh, here, I'm gonna. A bit rather large with the intention of turning my hand into a bluff by the river, and so I want to bet a decent amount here so that he'll call and then fold when I blast through it on the river. So, you know, when I pick that large sizing, it's, I mean, it is sometimes for value, right? But as a whole, it's with the intention of turning my hand into a bluff because you know, also it should be pretty hard for a villain to have really strong hands when he's first one checks back the flop, two, I start putting in the money on on the four that I hit. So like, you know, it's hard for him to now have pocket fours, two pairs that that uh, hit with the four. Although I guess the board was, you know, relatively high that he should not have too many combinations of like, you know, jack four, queen four, etc. But when we're wide v wide, uh, he still should be defending all the suited copies of those hands. Ace jack, I threw a bit here. But it's not like my opponent can have like offsuit versions of, uh, you know, queen four, jack four. Uh, before I fold this, stopping to scan the, the table because this is certainly profitable against weaker players in the blinds. So as you can see, just, you know, very, very aggressive. Trying to just kind of run people over a little bit because, you know, they play poorly facing aggression. This hand would have called a four bet here. Um, a bunch of different ways I can play this. Definitely want to at least start putting in a small bet on a board that's going to be so favorable for me and then kind of evaluating from there. Villain should not have, be too jack heavy when he floats here. So this is a relatively safe card for me. Also, I think it's somewhat unlikely for Villain to blast off twice with like pocket nines or tens. So this is probably going to be a good spot where I'm going to just go call call.
I mean, if he's good enough to put in tens here, right? Like, you know, good for him. But I don't think people will necessarily value that thinly, especially when I check all the turn. I can have jacks. I can have, you know, aces there. But, you know, usually when you bet those flops, your opponents are less likely to float you with those kind of, like, low overpairs. Or, like, low low overpair blockers, right? Like, if he has, like, queen-jack, jack-10, those are the first, you know, often the first candidates to fold facing the bets because, you know, villain's just going to have a plethora of, um, you know, ace-jack of spades or something like that to float with. Slightly incorrect sizing, but you know, you get the idea. Just kind of look for the sizing here, or look for his timing. I mean, he thought about it. It's a bit larger on this double connected. And here I have an 8 and a jack. It has a little bit of coordination here. Um, I think it's unlikely Villain has another queen. If he does, he's just going to put it in himself. So I'm just going to put in a small bet to try to extract against most of his like, smaller pocket pairs and stuff like that. Right, so playing very hand against hand against these weaker opponents. And then, you know, obviously still going to fall back if an opponent is what I suspect to be regular, full stack, open to normal sizing. I'm going to just play kind of range versus range. But also notice that, you know, when I get to the river and with the uh, ace-queen and go, you know, bet one-third or one-quarter on the river, and all of the draws have also blanked out, one of the other kind of, uh, you know, essentially, when I get to the river and I bet small with a queen, if he's got a queen, I'm not going to lose too much value because it's very likely that he is going to um, put in a raise there, right? It should be pretty irresistible for the opponents to just call with trips there, right? Um, Dylan should not have, be very heavy on the 9x here, so I'm just going to try to punch through the gate. Uh, but so I'm not going to lose any value against Queen. If I bet large and he's got a pocket pair, it's unlikely that it's going to call for three streets there. Um, and if he's got a draw, the only way I'm going to get money is if I can induce the draw to um, to to bluff somehow. So I, if I just check, I think a lot of the times draws will just like check back there. So I'm not gonna not gonna win too much money from that. I just range bet on a advantage board for me because I think checking there is probably just opening the doorway to get run over a little bit too too often. Like there's just not that much advantage in having kind of a a balanced checking back range on those kind of flops while on something that is more connected, right? Like you're gonna induce more mistakes from your opponents. King nine here. Probably call. This is gonna be a three bet. Holding the nine X and eight X off suit hands is very good here. Villain starts with a small sizing, even though he's allowed to he's allowed to go large here, so let's kind of kind of evaluate from here. Turn goes check check. There's not really any kind of hands that I want to extract from. I don't like that villain's thinking about it. It's just a fold against that sizing. Um, here. I'm going to play a check with this hand. Oh, villain's super snap checks to me, so I'm just going to... That's small. <laughs> Easy game. That's sometimes the good thing about, like, tanking. 
<laughs> as you're like deciding your bet size and your opponent just has like auto fold on. He's like, oh, he's thinking about his bet size. I can just I can just give it up. It's like there's been a couple times where when I played live, I'm like reaching for my chips. Or I'm like counting out my chips and not even putting out a bet, and the villain just is like, oh, cease fire, and they just fold. I'm just like, man, I was actually thinking about checking back. Okay, so villain super snap checks back here. So he just can't have too strong of a high end hand. So this this hand actually is gonna hit him pretty decently. So obviously gonna try to play for stacks here. Pretty good turn for us. It should be pretty hard for Villain to have. I mean, he can still have some King X here by the river. I'm just like never going to get any bluffs here. Let's kind of see what he had by the river. Nothing. <laughs> he had nothing. It's like when you open a fortune cookie and it says you have no future. It's very, it's very disturbing. Pocket force heads up, always going to be a call here. I guess at this depth, this could be like a 0.5% 3 bet or something like that. Just so you do have 4s in your 3 betting range. Uh, always going to call here. You know, often when you're facing like a larger size and you have these under pairs that don't have very much interactivity and you're kind of wondering, you know, do I want to proceed or not? You often want to proceed when you have a club. Like the third pair here. It's not bad. Uh, here, can probably bet large with the intention of blasting through by the river. Um, here, I don't think that villains should really be incentivized to check a lot of flushes the, re the way we've reached this river here. So I'm going to turn my hand into a bluff. Um, and then I'm going to bet small here. Because, like, I could check back and win, I don't know, 45% of the time there? Maybe, you know. But if I can just overbet there and win 99% of the time, yeah, let's take that. And a lot of that also stemmed from my, you know, my opponent relatively quickly just checking when the, you know, when uh, the draws got there. Didn't really think about, uh, do I want to go thin? Just unlikely that he's going to be setting some kind of, like, deep trap for me. Like, very often even when people are, like, thinking about traps, they're like, ah, is this a combo that I set a trap? They're going to be thinking about it. With a little bit, a little bit more timing, uh, this hand floats or raises against small bets. I mean, you know, a little bit more accurate would probably be to have a a better kicker here, but still gonna come after this. Uh, and now that I have, like, no... I've completely whiffed on the interactivity here. Just gonna give this up. Uh, here, check raise. The flop. Not really too much incentive to now bet the turn. Uh, here I check raise, flop. Turn goes check, check. Uh, I think I'm gonna overbet here. This guy has a hand worse than a jack a lot of the times here. A lot of gut shots now have gotten there by the river. So let's see if he gives me credit. I mean, he also can have just like King Queen here, but he also checked the turn relatively quickly. Um, should not be easy for him to find a lot of bluffs here. I mean, maybe, maybe it is, but. I think having a nine there was mediocre because it blocked some of his just like double backdoor floats. Absolutely horrendous situation here. 
I mean, I guess I have to call because my hand should have the requisite amount of equity against everything except aces. But <laughs> only bad things can happen from here. Okay, cool. He just has kings. Just has kings or queens or something like that. Just doesn't even think about it. Uh, this was a mistake with this uh, player on my immediate left. But now is uh, very profitable because the rest of the players were bad. So can I play a mixed strategy here? No value. Easy game. No need to turn my hand into bluffs when my opponent is not interested in the pot. Right? If the pot's like a medium size, the likelihood that my hand has shown on value diminishes a lot when I have fourth or fifth pair. But when the pot is, you know, four big blinds, the likelihood that ace king or his bottom pair is um, is the best hand is actually quite high, so I can just kind of just ride that ride that equity down. Like so similarly here, betting flop and, and turn is not horrible, but uh, here, once my opponent makes it 12, I I can just uh, jam some combos of this. I should not be doing this, like, pure, in my opinion. He didn't snap. Right. 12 big blinds. Red line up. You can also imagine over the course of the session, my red line is an eagle. I definitely could have gotten him, got him off that hand at some point. You guys can't tell, but I just put down my coffee and picked up a Diet Coke. I'm very prepared for this session. Again, if he's not going to show interest in the pot, no need to really fight for it here. Turns pretty mediocre for us. Gonna check back and call the river. Easiest game. It's like don't don't even think about it, right? We just know. Oh, four flush. Oh, guys, that guy could have anything, especially when it comes like runner runner. Right, just a little bit less likely that he, or, or it becomes a little less important um, by the river. Like when one flush card comes in and he like bets large, yeah, it's a little bit more likely he has got he's got those hearts. But when two cards come in, I mean, obviously reduces the combinations of flushes that he can have, but also makes it more likely that a uh, villain just has hands that have absolutely no showdown value and they're going to need to turn it into a bluff. Um, relatively unlikely that anyone has a 3x here. So I'm going to bet small here and then kind of try to blast through rivers. Like, okay, yeah, still, still going to go with the, the same plan here. I think it's extremely unlikely any player has a 3x type hand or 6-7 here. Oof. <laughs> That's a... Uh, I mean, I guess a good call, but... <laughs> probably a little on the speculative side. Also, I, I imagine that his hand would have just bet in the presence of the fish after it's checked him, but... What do I know? Oh, should have checked back King 2. I don't mind sizing this up to 11 because of our depth, but keep it kind of simple.
Hey guys, I'm gonna go before uh, dinner, before the study session. Later. Cool, take it easy. What time is the study session? Is it 7 or 8? Um, 8 central. Okay, 8 central. Okay. Uh, hey, no problem. Get your grub on, man. See you soon. I will sit in for the study session as well this evening. See what y'all are up to. Uh, here. Ace Queen is going to be a small 4-bet. Actually, I'm sorry. This is a mistake. I should just open Jam Ace Queen. I actually think that's better. And sevens is the fold against the the twelve x. Yeah, I think open jam in here. I need to open jam ace queen king jack suited to some frequency, and then maybe like a little bit of tens. Don't don't ever want to open jam a hand like aces or kings, obviously. But but pretty pretty unexploitable to just rip ace queen offsuit four hundred bigs there. In the same way that you can often rip like Ace King offsuit uh, pre flops, well, does a, a bunch of amazing things. First off, it's you know it's just unexploitable. Lets you kind of realize all of the EV of your hand, but more, uh, somewhat more importantly, is that it off it changes the topography of your post flop value to bluff ratios. That is, you're often removing between sixteen and twenty combos of uh, bluffs on like low boards and replacing them with a range that is just more like over pair concentrated and so it's just it lets you range bet on some non ace king flops a little bit more comfortably uh, in spots where GTO probably plays a, a, a little bit more of a mix so for example when you raise under the gun button 3 bets you, you jam ace king off suit that means the times that you just do the small four bet now you see a jack high flop you know very often a jack or a queen high flop you have to kind of play of a mixed strategy if you have all of your ace king off suits but you get to play pure betting strategies if you uh have diluted your ace kings and have just you know or queens and stuff like that Hopefully we get 3-bet here. I can just rip it. Nope. And you merge that range. Or not really merge, but you know, you mix up that range by occasionally jamming a hand like kings. In later positions, you can jam a hand like queens or jacks. Um, and so very often, you know, your opponents should basically be calling a lot of their, like, medium and high pairs at 3-bet. Like jacks calls and stuff like that um, but occasionally they should be folding some of those or at least mixing their calls with like ace king um, uh, and jacks and stuff like that and so sometimes people will just like pure call with ace king offsuit they just kind of get wrecked when you have kings And there have been a lot of times where I've just open ripped Ace King offsuit and then got called by, uh, by worse hands here. So basically, calling with sixes is like calling us a, a tiny three bet out of position here. Uh, actually, I think I'm just gonna fold against that sizing. Like I know that when people like, I mean sixes might actually be close, but I know when people like five exit, you can fold threes on the button or threes in the big blind. So yeah, I, I'm not really sure, but can't can't be bad. Free betting can't be a great option. Calling can't be a great option. So probably just get it out of the way is fine until I see that there's an opponent who's consistently six xing it. In which case, then obviously I'm gonna kind of make a make a read. Uh, my opponents really haven't been three betting me in position a lot. Right, I'm just not haven't gotten to a lot of like natural four bet spots. Haven't gotten three bet a lot. So I'm gonna be able to open a little bit wider. And occasionally just check back a uh, hand that can now go call call. 
Uh, when someone sizes up here, it's a little bit of incentive to raise, but still just want to mostly just call. Uh, here on this flop, I'll we'll probably just start with a small C bet and kind of evaluate. I'm pretty obligated to raise this small and then fold to uh, more action. Uh, when this guy makes it an absurd size, I don't actually have to make a defense with this hand anymore. Easy game. I'm going to min-raise targeting this big blind. So I was really happy that my opponent would just turn his hand face up against me, you know. You know, who knows if I made any more money by checking or betting, because I, you know, I'm not looking at his hand right now, but possible I made made a little bit more. Just gonna call, leave all his bluffs in. Villain snap check back a turn. I don't think he's gonna bluff enough on the river. So I'm just gonna bet small here. Still think he's a very strong hand. But I, if I think if I check, he'll check a lot, so definitely we just wanna put in a small bet there. This guy's probably a recreational player. He's got a little depth behind him, so I want to keep my foot on the gas. And obviously, if I think a player is going to be a push around in his calling node, probably means that when he four bets me, he's extra strong. So easy fold. Probably going to get out of the way with the. You know, when a guy 3x's and then 4-bets 3x, just going to give him a lot of credit for having ace-king plus. So, you know, defending with ace-king suited, or I'm sorry, ace-queen suited becomes significantly worse. Okay, so we've seen this opponent now 4.5x it multiple times, so obviously you can just treat it as just him being ridiculous. Um, I think this is fine. Obviously, going to go broke with jacks here. Going to play for stacks on a, a huge amount of flops. Just going to start with a half pot bet and put it in. Ah, probably should have bet smaller. Get him to jam on us. Under the gun limper. Um, not the best flop for us. Uh, I'm going to fold with this guy on my immediate left. But definitely have a hand that still has the ability to, like, call here. King queen might be the best hand. I backdoor spades. So I'm going to call here and then see, see how we get to the river. Often going to bluff the river, obviously. Okay. So... Just betting enough to get him off of a like ace high type hand. Actually, I might have waited too long there. Okay, just want to make sure that I'm betting enough to get him off ace high. I think if I bet half pot, he might actually get curious. And it's just unlikely given the speed at which he check back he, that he's thinking about you know because like he'd think about value betting, I don't know like smaller pairs and stuff like that. Like, you at least stop and think. Could open 2.5x with this guy here. And the guy to my immediate left. Good result. Going to check on this mediocre board for us out of position to two players. If this guy raises, it's really gross. Probably going to have to fold here.
It's a pretty gross spot. I'm actually not sure there. I think that when the guy that guy bet bets half pot, yeah. I mean, a lot of min raises in that spot, in my opinion, are are quite strong. So I don't think it's a huge mistake to be folding there. I think the shorter stacked we are, the happier I am to put it in. But also, the guy overclawed pre flop, and the board had like a six and a five or whatever. You know, when it has like those kind of pseudo connector type cards, it's just much more likely that villain has combinations of both. Two pairs and sets. Flop bottom pair with double back doors here. Almost always going to be a call facing this size. Um, I'm going to check. Let's see how much he bets. This hand often is going to consider turning itself into a bluff. And now that I've reached the river in this way, I should be checking here. Easy game? <laughs> you didn't even think about it. Jeez. Usually when you, you know, uh, turn your hand and it goes check check on the river, you can think about check raising uh, for value. So like, you know, you turn bottom set or you turn a set. Right? You runner runner trips. You turn and or river uh, to pair, right? As a defender, those hands are all now going to be considered candidates to check raise uh, bluff. I'm sorry, check raise for value. Um, this hand probably mixes in theory here. Having the six and the sevens Really good around the nine and the four. <sighs> kind of annoying that villain donks here. I, I'm, I'm going to have to just keep calling here. I'm only trying to get my opponent to fold. Like small parts of their range here. Like draws. You know, queen 10, stuff like that. So. Just about small. Never going to get him to fold a jack. Never going to get him to fold a nine, obviously. Not that he should be. Um, checking very many nines to me. Not that he... It's really hard for him to reach the river with a nine where he, like, leads the the turn jack, right? Like, that should be not a card that he's really, really happy to lead on. Um, but I, I didn't like a large, like, overbet sizing, mostly because I was worried that, uh, if villain's representing a jack, jack's never folding there on the river, right? It's just going to snap call. So I think the sizing that I want to uh, to use is just very small to try to attack all of his, like, hands that try, just try to buy equity on the turn and, and, you know, blocked me to prevent me from just, like, blowing them up. I was going to 3-bet myself. <clears throat> against regular opponents that hand uh, becomes a candidate to cold 4 bet having the king of the 10 is very very good obviously This hand probably three bets. Yeah. Make it ten because I'm polarized. I said polarized. Okay. Rather up. 
really important that in your big blind three betting game, you're hitting all of these kind of, you know, uh, weak suited 10x jack x type hands occasionally. You know, uh, three betting your offsuit king, king, queen, and jack with the nine, eights, and sevens. Um, see, if this was like a cutoff limp, I would always raise this hand, but against under the gun, full stack. Gonna give him a little bit of credit. You do see a lot of like limp re raises because someone, people think it's in vogue. The 2.5 it facing these two weaker players in front of me. If this guy makes it like 12 or 13, I can start having a flatting range, but. Here, often want to play big, better, check. I mean, you can play a bunch of different strategies here, but I'm going to play big, better, check. And so I'm going to start with a check back. Here, obviously, not going to get any value. That's fine. I feel embedded into me. Might be a spot to put in a gigantic raise. I think that's pretty reasonable. Ugh. Ooh, so need a stretch. You know, but hopefully you can see that being extremely aggressive, trying to hand read your opponents deeply based on their the action and their timing, it's really, really nasty, right? Like you can you can really zero in and play really exploitative poker once you're just kind of aware at all times what your opponent is doing, what they're thinking about. Uh, and mostly just using this kind of idea that when your opponents take a while to think about it, it's often because they have like fringier hands or like you know, quite strong hands, right? So like, it's very rare that your opponent just goes snap, call, snap, call, snap, call, and then they show you like bottom set, right? Bottom set usually is like, wait a little bit on a flop check raise, wait a little bit, bet turn, right? Like there's gonna be some timing involved because they're just trying to like figure out what is the best way to manipulate you. Meanwhile, when they have like pocket sevens on a 10 high board, they just go call, 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 call. So your barrels are just going to be a little bit more effective in, in general. And that also generally means that your blockers are much more effective because your opponent's range is going to be extremely narrowed to like, you know, very small range of hands there. And when your opponent's range is narrowed um, so dramatically, that means that your, uh, your blockers are just, you know, just dramatically more effective. So. I'm gonna call and keep his bluffs in. Obviously gonna jam jam a bunch of rivers. Hard for him to have exactly pocket tens here, hard for him to have eights. Yeah, maybe his eights, but it'd be really weird to lead the turn. Okay, so got him to put in the, the final river bet, which is nice. You're gonna play a mix strategy. Here I wanna play like, you know medium size better check uh, and also with a little bit of depth I want to be a little bit more polar when I bet there and so checking back here just make sure that I can check here and then have some like call calls on good run outs okay now the villain checks to me twice it's just very likely I have the best hand just don't see him bet like here if he has like pocket tens or jacks or something like that it's a lot of reason that he wants to have protection, say with like a 9x type hand. So he's often got like uh, ace high or like 7s or 6s, so I can bet small here. Probably bet very, very small on the river and then call. I think that's pretty reasonable. Yeah, so I like betting like really small here. I mean, obviously I'm worried about 6s exactly, but I think I think I can do something like this and then press call when he raises. Okay. Well, probably figured called out his hand, given his timing there. He like he thought about <laughs> he thought about the tenth bet and the standard standard four bet a hundred percent of the time there. Uh, if, again, the blinds were weaker. I'd open four five.
I talk about this all the time in the study group, right? When you're playing against non-standard opponents, you should be using non-standard strategies yourself. And hopefully this is kind of reinforcing that idea. A lot of this stems also from playing a mixed strategy, right? Like if you're playing just a kind of a pure betting strategy on the flop as simplification, you don't get access to these kind of like reads on turn after you check back and stuff like that. Um, but I love having like these bear traps against your opponent where you're just uh, insanely confident that your hand is the best hand and then you can just like bet a tenth of the pot snap call on the river. Uh, especially as you move up to higher stakes that becomes quite important. Um, a mixed strategy here. I mean, having the six is pretty good. Obviously, having like an eight or something is a little bit better here. Um, I think I'm still obligated to call here. Okay, well, he sizes up fairly large here on a board where doesn't really need to pick a large sizing, so I can just kind of just read into that and go for it. Uh, one of the main reasons why I started with a check is because we had a little bit of depth to us, and so, you know, when we're 140, 150 big blinds deep, or even like 200 big blinds deep, I'm much more incentivized to play a much more polar strategy, because... When I pick a uh, small sizing, I'm basically always letting my opponent correctly uh, call with his, you know, double backdoors, overcards, and stuff like that. Basically, all of his implied odds hands are going to have just a really, really easy time continuing against me. So, there's no real re incentive for me to just pick a small sizing, both from a theoretical perspective and just, you know, in in a uh, putting my opponent into a vice perspective. Here with a little bit of depth, definitely love three betting. These kind of board coverage slash implied odds type hands. This hand is also a really good hand to call a 4-bet with, so it's going to be appealing here. Uh, you know, this hand actually has more EV than like pocket 8s or 9s here in terms of trying to hit a hand to busto aces here. You know, and very often you're going to hit a board that's like, you know, 4-5 or something like that, or like, you know, a, a board that you're just going to have a very obvious time drawing to. Right, so if it's like a 7-high board, a 6-high board, I mean, often I'm going to be playing for stacks. Um, yeah, so like, you know, Villain just bets like half pot here. He's very often just telling me the strength of his hand. So even if this board was just like 10 high, right, like, I mean, depending on who my opponent was, I could just think about folding or, or just jamming there. Honestly, you know, if my opponent's playing kind of balanced, has enough uh, have bluffs there, I'd probably just jam. I think Villain has like, you know, queens there a lot. You know, queens and jacks are the most incentivized, in my opinion, to probably bet, like, half potish, Mostly because a lot of my, uh, a lot of my hands that will float there to a smaller sizing are going to have, like, a ton of equity against them. Like, so a lot of the times I just have, like, ace-king or something like that. And so they're really, really incentivized, especially with, like, jacks that just try to deny me, a, a, like, a bunch of that equity off the, off the rip. Villain should not be too, too X heavy here. I have blockers to a 10. So I'm just going to begin to apply pressure. Um, with more back doors, I would consider raising here. So now that I've turned this to pair here, this now this hand plays now as a river check raise slash, you know, bluff catcher or whatever. So
by picking such a polar size and villain actually cost himself money there because if he bet a smaller size I would have raised a little bit on the loose end here but the small blind it's probably on the weaker end confirmed and so when people are like man where does that extra VPIP come from Right? Like, oh, you want to play more hands. When, when do you know to play more hands? Well, just, just look at the big blind. Right? How strong of these guys can they be? With the dummy end of the gut shot, I'm just going to fold this. But if I had ace, 10, or ace, jack, obviously I'd float 100% of the time. Well, I guess it's because I have such an implied odds hands and it's so cheap, I can call here. But it's it's actually quite close. So this is why I want to call, right? Because I want to hit a hand like 774 and then just try to break someone. Although I will say, you know, as the the last guy to call, I should be the one most likely to have pocket sixes here, right? Or, or you know, a 6x type hand. So very deep, if this guy bet here, I could just like go crazy on him. Okay, this guy, cold call preflop, bet four ways here. So he just has like tens. Hey, Boo, could you do me a huge favor? Oops. I think my girlfriend has her headphones on. Don't do it. Don't do it. No. Fine. Fine, fine, fine. You can see basically every player at this these stakes are recreational. Not extremely approved here. But just gonna go for it. Again, opponent's kind of recreational, so a lot of uh a lot of incentive in just like betting small and just seeing how your opponent responds. I make this metaphor that very often a small bet is like a jab because it just kind of like establishes a baseline reading that you can repeatedly use to just get an idea of what your opponent is doing, their timings and stuff like that. And I think a lot of the times people are not paying enough attention to like all, you know, all of the, the nuances and, and, and dynamics of a hand. I think in live poker, this is also like extra, extra true when you have like the, the stand-up game, right? You have all these other kind of extra things going on. Here, when there's a presence of a fish, this pot is a little bit protected. So I think it's just a lot less likely that villain is going to be uh, bluffing here. So I think raising and just trying to put the money in might be a little bit dangerous. Let's kind of see what he bets on the turn. If he bets like 30, I might have to just fold. Maybe that's like 10 here. Yeah. This is very annoying. I mean, I think he just sizes this big here. Yeah, I don't know about it. I think out of position, it's just going to be really hard to reach my reverse, my, you know, like uh, my implied odds there. Uh, I mean, I'm going to donk a lot of rivers there, but it, it's going to look a little bit fishy when I just go like check call, check call, donk on the three flush. Uh, here I'm going to play a mix of big better check and check this hand this time. Not thrilled. In this line villain actually should have like, like random two pair type hands, but You know, the power of playing, you know, 
a full mix is that you get your opponents to just randomly make assumptions about your ranges that are definitely not going to be always true. For example, you know, he thought, you know, essentially when he overbets there, he's calling me out for not having ASEX enough. Or, 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 you know, reasonable pairs enough. Um, sounds kind of close. This guy calls, I'm going to squeeze here because I want to just try to isolate the weaker player. Uh, facing a min raise, though. Tan calls a bunch. Especially like 130 deep. Don't really want to 3-bet and then face a ton of smoke. Be weird to face a raise. I'd be not thrilled about it. Easy isolation. Hopefully one or two of these weaker opponents call. Very happy. Flop, I want to play more big bet or check here and try to get a lot of the money in. Loves it. Still going to keep betting on the turn. And if he puts in a raise here, easiest fold in the world. Right. I actually never checked. Where does my face appear? Okay. Not too high that we can't see the, the action in the OBS. Villain bet's quite large here, which I'm like really not thrilled about having the low end of the of this, but still I think my hand's a little bit too good to fold here. This should be a card that's reasonable for me to donk. I mean, what 10x does this guy have here? I'm, I'm really confused, but I have relatively bl good blockers here. Ah! I missed a value bet here. Uh, just l led the turn when the board like increased in coordination, because in theory, right, often when straights, the medium coordination cards improve, I'm allowed to have a donking range there, and just kind of freezes up my opponent and allows me to buy some buy some equity there. So often I'm, I'm spending like, you know, a tenth of the pot to win 20% equity or something like that. So if I'm, if I'm investing less money and occasionally just getting folds, occasionally opening myself up to, you know, like other other bluffing opportunities there. Depending on run outs, I can turn my hand into a bluff as well. Because villain should be relatively capped there, right? So in theory, after I dunk there, I can go for a lot of large uh, continuations. And you can see I'm definitely really disrespecting my opponents, coming after them pre-flop with a lot of hands that, you know, are not are not that strong here. Um, okay, so the likelihood that an opponent is weak when they have a 500 stack is actually pretty high, uh, because I think especially at these limits, the likelihood that your opponent is really good and just, like, running in up against everyone is a lot uh, a lot less than if... Um, I guess we're a little bit deep, maybe that's so small in their call. Um then the likelihood that he's just a fish who is just getting lucky repeatedly, right? So I try to actually attack these guys and assume that they are weaker rather than, than stronger.
Okay, cool. We have study group in half an hour, so let's wrap it up, take a little bit, bit of a break. This was a very, a very good session. What I really like about this is, you know, didn't have to get lucky at all. Didn't win any flips. Didn't cooler anyone, right? Just really, really out, outplayed people post flop and just ground them, ground them down, right? You know, value bet against ace king, ace jack and queen stuff, stuff hands like that. Again, also, you know, there's a lot to say about just raising that hand and then later on being able to turn it into a bluff when your opponent's like fairly capped and the board should just hit you really, really strongly. Right? So, you know, again, with these jabs, it's not only just for the immediate value, but it also is for the possibility of turning your hand into a bluff in the future. So, for example, you know, let's say the, the high end of the four straight comes in. After villain checks back the flop, it's very likely that he does not have too much 9x interactivity or like the high end, or the, and he definitely doesn't have the low end straight. Right, so there's, you know, the possibility that I can just, like, blast through on a lot of the low ends and try to get him to fold an overpair, uh, which is a lot of his, like, check back call call range. It's going to be, like, aces, kings and stuff like that. I mean, at the higher stakes, I don't think that these guys are that incentivized or that inclined to slow play kings on these low boards as they should. I'm going to three bet here, call, or I'm going to call three bets here, especially against the sizing. Have a lot of a lot of depth behind, a lot of maneuverability post flop here, uh, makes it even even better here. I mean, in some senses, it makes it worse because it reduces the stack to pot ratio, um, but it gives me just better odds to just try to hit like trips and just like blast someone, right? But I don't like that it, it does reduce the stack to pot ratio here, right? Because if it's just eighteen instead of twenty four, right? We have so much maneuverability, 10, 10 times the pot. When it's twenty four, now it's just eight times the pot, and also when he's in the pot, right? There's no there's no real bluffing rooms three way, so. Let's continue busting some ass at 50 for session number two, where I maximum disrespect everybody while sipping must draw awkwardly. Ace four. Let's go, go ahead and three bet my opponent. I assume that the under the gun opponent's not going to be four betting me. Seem to be just giving it up without even a thought. Going to raise this hand uh, quite on the loose side here, but there's going to be weaker players in the blinds who I want to play against. So we're going to just try to maximize my V pip. And here, just going to gonna bet small on the flop. Hopefully, just get to take it down. Here, obviously, going to call with a jack. No problem. I'm gonna call it here. Um, I'm probably gonna fold the river. Here, if this guy checks to me, I'm gonna go for a bluff and it's a limp pot. He bets three times. I guess we'll just give it to him. Ooh, villain calls me down with ace high. Good for him. Here. King four. Pretty easy defense. Just gonna check fold here, having no back doors. If I had some clubs, I would probably consider continuing. Your standard raise. Uh, here with ace-10 against the small blind, I'm going to start with a check, kind of evaluate from here. Um, I don't think he really has much of a hand to call me with by the river, so I'm just going to bet a little bit on the small end, try to get value from, you know, pocket fives, pocket sevens. I'm not really sure why he would turn that hand into a bluff against that sizing. If I bet larger, it makes sense, but I think in particular with his timing tells, it was just 
Check to me too fast on earlier streets to be able to represent a strong hand uh, later on. Here I assume both these players are weaker. This guy is short stack and he limped. This guy isolated only to 2x. So I don't really like having much of a calling range uh, in the big, sorry, not the big blind, the small blind, but going to make an exception here. Here I get to this opponent. I'm going to start with a small bet and go into check call, check call. Let me check back here. I'm going to bet the river myself. Uh, everyone checks back here against these weaker players in a relatively small pot. Just going to try to get to showdown. And then here we're going to mostly just press call facing any sizing that is not ridiculous here. And I expect to you know, beat a bunch of random hands. Good for him. Good for him. Unfortunately, in the small blind, big blind dynamic, um, you're often going to lose a lot of bets when you have second pair against top pair. Because it's really hard for you to really want to fold. I'm just going to three bet five six here, but now I'm just going to fold here. I'm bet small. I'm just going to call here and then kind of read what goes on on the river. I'm not feeling it. It's very unlikely if villain has a serious hand, he's going to snap min raise or min bet the river. So it's kind of take advantage of his timing and his sizing. Uh, here we're going to raise ace-5 into this small blind. Eh, it's a little bit mediocre with this uh, player on my immediate left, because if he cold calls me, I'm going to really hate myself. Here I am allowed to occasionally overbet, because I can have top two sets and villain cannot. He can have all of the, his king-queen offsuit here, though, so... Should only be able to overbet a small portion of my range. The queen should... You know, be pretty good for my opponent from out of position, so I'm going to check back. And now that Villain checks to me, he should be relatively un relatively capped there, so let's bet three times the pot and just take it down. Here we're going to min-raise into the not full stack big blind. Easy game. So looking for all of these reasons to VPIP as often as possible. Uh, always a little bit nerve-wracking when you're facing the early position limpers because these guys are going to have limp re-raises. Um, and I probably will not be able to call a limp re-raise because if it's like 15 big blinds, you know, like the stack to pot ratios are going to be a little bit wonky. Villain starts out with a two-thirds pot size bet on a board. That should hit a lot of his limping range. He should have like more 4x, more 5x here. I'm actually just going to fold. I think generally if I can overrun my opponent with isolations and then small bets, it's that implies that when they donk into me, especially for a substantial size, it's because they have it. So... Also, on these, like, low ace wheel boards, you know, I'm going to have a lot of checks. Because the out-of-position player, whether it be the big blind or the limper, is going to have a lot of the lower-end future cards. So, uh, here sixes could be a call if everyone else behind me was bad. Uh, and here, with no interactivity with the board, no spade, probably going to have to just give this up. I had a spade there. Uh, it's a, probably a mix between calling and check-raising.
Easy three bet here. Six seven is close, particularly in the higher rake categories. Uh, here, just can bet small with all of my back doors, and after it goes under the gun, uh, middle. I'm sorry, under the gun cutoff, and then hold four bet here. You can really only need to show up with just extraordinarily strong hands. Uh, here when I bet very small in the flop, Dylan can definitely float me with a lot of aces, particularly when there's a 5 and a 2 on the board. He's going to have a lot of like hands that have double back doors when he has an ace because of the wheel interaction. So I'm just going to check on this turn. Uh, here if Dylan had 2 pair, I think he would bet a different sizing. Hard for him to have any activity with seven when I have hit the seven here. So I'm just going to put in a large raise and kind of put it put it to villain here because I don't have too much showdown value just calling here because I don't think he's going to be, you know, betting like, you know, a, a five or whatever. So finds the call button. Shouldn't always call there with an ace X, but he did have, you know, the, I guess, I mean, he wasn't, he wasn't trying to block the straight there yeah this didn't believe me but really like turning my hand into a bluff when i hit the uh the river card that essentially blocks a lot of my opponents like his natural um two pair type hands and like backdoor sets etc And I picked a nice fat sizing that would make it hurt, but there's a chance that villain was just recreational. And if he's just recreational, then, you know, just going to press call. If I had suited ace three, would definitely like to come over the top. Going to size down slightly into the half stack. Both because I don't need to size up against his actual uh, hand, and because um, I want to incentivize him to defend and then call. Uh, I have a backdoor overcard with an undercard to the board, so it's kind of a a little bit of a mix on the flop here. Now that I hit this turn card, just gonna keep firing. Can't pick a large sizing because this does improve interactivity on the board. Gets the job done. This is a hand class probably a lot of people don't spend enough time thinking about is, you know, uh, having an overcard to the board, but then really being sensitive to your undercard or as your, your second card. So if your second card is like middling, very often you are very incentivized to check because you have, you know, one card that is to, uh, has shown on value with top pair, and then one card that has shown on value with second pair. Um, but when you have an overcard and undercard on the board, what happens is that your undercard does not have any shown on value. So essentially, a hand that maybe had six outs when you have like a high medium card uh, to showdown value now only has three outs. So you're a little bit less incentivized to check back and realize equity. You care a little bit less when you get check raise in the flop, so you can just go ahead and, and bet and then use those hands um, as barrels and bluffs in, in other parts of your range. You're just going to start with a small bet. Well, thanks for a little bit in calls. I'm going to size up now. Everyone checks through here. I'm going to size up to represent the fact that I could have a king so I can think about turning my hand to a bluff on a future street. It would be relatively unlikely that this guy has a king given the way this hand is played out, so I'm going to overbet the river. He should also not have queen jack that often, and I can, I guess, I guess I can have it here. Um, race nines here. 
Board comes to Broadway. It's going to start with a check. You just should not have very many nutted hands here, so just try to blow them up here. I'm good about half pot. This hand will barrel through a decent amount on future streets. I'm going to bet this sizing so. I can max out how much I get him to call and then fold by the river and then have the most fold equity by the river because if he just calls here, he's going to be you know, somewhat capped. So, yeah, I was going to blast that river and then going to force him into some awkward spots. And especially when I bet the turn at that sizing and he doesn't raise me. Just really likely he has like top pair, bad kicker, which is not really, I mean, you know, top pair is not really going to fold very often in three of pots, but he's going to have a lot more second pair type hands or some kind of like float that has like barely enough equity there, and then it's going to have to fold unimproved on the river. Obviously, because I'm playing this polar strategy, I'm going to want to uh, you know, raise to the larger sizing here. And then, you know, villain makes it something really ridiculous, so obviously don't need to play back. Um, and, th and that plays just really bad, essentially, because I just don't have indifferent hands anymore. Right? Like, I only have to continue with, like, the nuts. Like, even Jax is not indifferent there anymore. Ace 10 mostly just calls here. Depending on the bet size, going to have to float the flop and kind of go from there. Just going to fold against the under the gun. Uh, here by the river. He shouldn't be checking. Too many kings here. I'm really trying to get him to fold like pocket sevens or something like that. And I don't like playing my hand uh, for its showdown value there. I think it's much more important to try to turn it into a bluff. On these kind of very low boards, I want to start with a check with most of my range, if not all of it. I don't that's 4x here. Fortunately, with the ace of spades, I don't think I can fold. Turn is a little bit of a blessing and a curse. We get there on the river. I think I should actually check here. This is probably, I think that's a mistake when I come runner runner top two pair. I should be checking there the majority of the time and letting my opponent bluff. So, so definitely my mistake. Of course, of course I recognize it's a mistake the moment after I press bet. And the moment after I press pot, I'm like, oh no, check raise. Check raise is much harder. Obviously, Queens is going to play for stacks. 7 8 is going to be a 3 bet. Uh, 
Uh, here with such a strong overpair advantage, get about one third. Don't need about too big here because, you know, if Illin has a part of it, he's going to rip on me. If he doesn't, he won't. Yeah, he has a lot of hands that still have a lot of equity against me. So, just going to continue to bet. Sizing that, you know, nines, jacks, tens, if they're going to continue, can hopefully just jam on me. Don't expect him to have very many 8x's. Obviously. And 4-bet pots, mostly will have found folds there. Can make a small isolation with kings and hopefully get someone else behind me to squeeze. Okay, unfortunately not getting any creativity here. No real reason to let this other guy fold. Always worrisome that the original razor is going to come over the top. Standard squeeze. He look calls pretty quickly, so unlikely he's got too much of this. Just going to start with a very, very small bet. Here, King-Queen obviously defends against a 3-bet. Lillen raises. Not too much reason for me to do anything besides just call and call river. Uh, this turn, I'm actually just going to donk all in. I don't think he's got any flush draws, but I do want to deny against a spade. Um, and here, I'm going to just bet small with, you know, blockers to kings and queens. I don't think this is going to be a spot where a villain is going to just like blast off with the weaker hand there. So I'm just going to leave myself to deny equity. And you're allowed to do that in like very, very low SPR spots. Um, either to make sure that villain doesn't check back and just like kind of realize all of his spades. Or when you have a spade yourself, you can just jam there for the same reason. You know, so for example, in like four bet pots, there's going to be spots where like you bet the flop with ace king. You turn the, you know, like the diamond draw, and so then you call, and then um, the on the river, you now lead when you get there. Sorry, I'm like thinking and trying to play at the same time. Uh, here should be a good spot where I can just bet a little bit and get the job done. My five has some interactivity. My ace is, you know, obviously generally good to be holding. Um, I'm going to check the turn and... See what it is on the river. If he checks back here, I'm going to obviously bluff river a lot. Okay, pretty good pretty good river for me to, to bluff here. Just need to bet a little bit more than half pot to get the job done. I'm really trying to get him to fold like, you know, eights, a seven, stuff like that. Probably after he checks back at that speed, he doesn't have jacks that much. Obviously, he doesn't have a queen, so. Um. Checking some small percentage of the time is not the end of the world. Or should be relatively innocuous. Brings in some hands that are now like pair plus draw. So the overbet should be my standard sizing there. Especially because my aces also unblock all of my opponent's kings because he should not have too much ace king there preflop. So you can see that my style, especially these stakes, is really much built around disrespecting my opponents, be pipping very aggressively, 
trying to hand read them very, very hard, especially. <coughs> Excuse me. Especially when they have a lot of like sizing tells, timing tells. It's crazy that, you know, you get so much information playing against people online, just looking at their sizings and those kind of patterns, that when you move over to live, while it is a completely different set of skills, like, you have so much more information when you can just look at your opponents. It's really wild. When you put everything together, that you just... It's really hard to not feel like you're telepathic at times. Obviously, as you know, you move up the stakes. You play against players who are more studied. You play it live, play against other players who are, like, online proficient. So, you know, they don't really give away too much information. Then it's another question. Here against a 3.5, you know, could a fold ace 7 here. I mean, probably fold ace 9. Ace 10 is pretty close. Ace jacks just always a 3 bet. I mean, really, when guys 3.5 or 4 exit in these very, very high rake structures, you mostly want to play 3 bet or fold even from the big blind. You just, like, really want to avoid calling 3x or 4x and then folding on the flop, right? It's just kind of a disaster. So as you can see, you know, not really doing much, not really making a lot of big hands. Just kind of slowly chipping up by being extra aggressive, reading into my opponents. You're going to start with a check back against the small blind. I'm probably going to call the turn and call a bunch of rivers. Uh, here I bet itty bitty on the flop. Just going to call, let my opponent continue to fire bluffs at me. Uh, here ace king. I think it's the value bet. I'm obviously going to call off with sand. Um, and now I can just check down. Wow, queen, called me out of the small blind with queen four, and people say online poker is dead. As you can see, I mean, every table at 50 is just full of <laughs> full of fish. This game is just extremely, extremely um, profitable. And there's a bunch of different ways that you can approach this game, like especially if you're coming up in the stakes. You know, I really recommend playing a simplification strategy, doing a lot of range betting, because, you know, stuff like this is just really, really hard for your opponents to counter, even though this is going to be a board where I often want to, you know, play a, a large bet or check strategy, even consider having an overbet strategy here. Uh, I peel this with a, with a heart. Um, but as you move up in the stakes and, and you just get better and better, or, you know, or as your intuition on how to play, more complicated strategies improves, then, you know, there's a lot of extra EV that can be gained because, you know, like, uh, there's a lot more than one way to skin a cat. A lot of people are just like, oh, I can just simplify against these people and this style will be really, really dominant. And I do really think that, you know, you could play just a very kind of mechanical style um, and just autopilot and have a really, really crushing win rate, e even uh, playing like 50 or 200 zone. Um... But especially when you move up against stronger players who uh, probably don't auto fold as often, probably just have you know are just generally a little bit more defended across their trees. You have to play you know more complicated strategies against them. Um, uh, if villain is a recreational player, this is pretty gross. So I'm just going to fold. Here should probably re-isolate. Now with so much so much dead money, I really like a jam size here. And this guy obviously is going to be never calling me. Good fade. You're going to bet, check, and then kind of evaluate on the river. Going for three streets here is probably going to be on the thin side. Villain definitely can still have ace-queen here. This turn aces look really, really good for me. I'm just going to keep betting 
with advantage. And there's not really too much that this guy can do about it, to be honest. I'm still going to have top set, two pair. Uh, I still get value when called, and then can staff check back river. You know, prevents me from uh, checking back and then just getting potted on the river, which is going to be kind of a gross spot for me. I think especially the higher in stakes you play when you get to play more exploitative strategies, a lot of times you realize that the best methodology or the most EV way to play a hand is not necessarily the most theoretical, it's simply what wins. Um, sometimes that may, it's because um, you know, you're betting to prevent your opponent from bluffing you in a spot that you're going to fold, so you preemptively bluff them. Sometimes it's recognizing that like when you have a hand and, and you're going to press call, you're going to only get into really weird spots on future streets where your opponents get to you know, put you in horrible spots. So preemptively you turn your hand into a bluff. I actually just saw a really interesting hand where Stefan turn, essentially turns top pair into a bluff for two bets. Where he's only facing two bets and then he turns his hand into a bluff with the intention of getting his opponent to fold over pairs. And I was like, oh wow, this is, this is quite high level. Um, this hand's actually not bad to to overbet here. Here, I'm going to bet small. Um, with the ace of diamonds, I'd consider floating here, but I'm just going to give this up. In later positions, that becomes a, a better and better call as my uh, showdown value from having an ace increases. But when it's like, you know, earlier position versus the big blind, just think that they're going to be slightly stronger than usual. You know, people are just very cognizant that when you open front of the gun, and a lot of money goes in, you're just going to show them aces, kings, queens, etc. So I think people are probably, as a whole, um, under bluff against the early position players. Right? Like, how often do you, like, three bet or four bet early position guys? I mean, you, I guess you can't four bet them, but how often do you, like, really try to go crazy on them? It's just not that often. My nine has some relevancy. Both of my hands have shown on value. Just gonna start with a check. Here with depth, I'm more inclined to play a, a large bet or check strategy. So uh, this guy checks to me twice. My hand has got to be good here, especially when I have the ace. So I'm gonna go for two smaller streets of value. Philip can still have occasionally have like Jacks, tens. I mean, I guess those hands probably just want to bet the turn for some protection. But have to have the best hand by the river, so I can just bet very small here and then call a raise. Okay. Seems, seems reasonable. Probably could have I'm gonna thought about a larger sizing there. Just because, you know, the... Your sizing should be commensurate with how confident you are you have the best hand that can either be, you know, theoretically or exploitatively. So, like, obviously if, you know, my hand has 99% chance of being the best, you know, picking a large, a large sizing makes a lot of sense. Um, I mean, from, like, a range-on-range range perspective. But if the action has gone in such a way where I'm just like, I'm 100% confident that my opponent cannot have top pair by the river, well then, you know, second pair top kicker is just effectively the nuts and can go for like an overbet or a large overbet. So um, there's definitely lines, especially when you're playing against weaker opponents, where you can check back second pair good kicker on the flop and the turn and then go for an overbet on the river because you're just infinitely confident that your opponent can't have it. Uh, here, I'm going to open Queen Jack for a min raise with weaker uh, players at the table. 
So this is something that's really critical that hopefully you see that I'm repeating over and over is that I'm stopping, kind of evaluating who's at the table and then going from there. Uh, here, this guy's weak, so I'm just going to isolate super, super aggressively here from under the gun. Always want to have a, a min bet. Here against the opponent, just going to bet large, especially unblocking um, all of the pairs. And then you're going to start with a call and then play pretty, pretty snugly on future streets facing aggression because you know from under the gun here villain should just have just have a lot of hands here so just gonna check it down the villain villain's gonna have a lot of a lot of interactivity there on the river that's a that's a very thin flop check raise i like how i played it though should you check raise that flop you should often be checking the turn rivers close it's pretty close If I had third, third pair or fourth pair, probably would have blasted the river large, but my handle had a little bit too much showdown value. Um, okay, this is probably a defense. So, I know that uh, 9 5 against the min raise is a call, so I probably th assumed that, you know, 2.2 .2 here meant that I should um, defend 9 6 suited. There, I went for a, a river over bet on the deuce. In a limped pot, but villain had slow played ace x to the river. Well played. I mean that sincerely, right? I mean not the limp part, but that he checked back a hand that probably was not gonna get many streets of value and recognized that I had air, and that the most likely way for him to extract from me was um was by checking back. My nine was better, so I had an ace ten suited there. With four bet. Especially with a little bit of depth behind, right? Like can definitely punish my opponents or put them in like kind of awkward spots. We're a little bit deeper, so a little bit more incentivized to size up and play a little bit more polar. Which actually makes Ace Queen a little bit more of a flat if those were the guidelines that I was going with, but you get the general idea. This is probably theoretically either extremely neutral um, or, I mean, maybe slightly losing at 15 no limit, but uh, in practice again, just gonna put the gas on my opponents. And, Expect to just not play them a lot post flop, so just want to get involved a lot of the time. If uh, if there were weaker players at the table, fours would be a raise. All right, weaker player at the table, so you know you know what it is. Same on this table. Probably only needed to have been raised against all of these stack sizes here. But, you know. Hopefully you can see that expanding our VPIP very, very significantly is is very good. I'm probably playing like 28, 24 or something like that. I think a lot of people don't realize that they're like, oh, I have a I have a losing red line. It's like, well, how many hands do you play? Are you playing 1815? Well then yeah, you're just gonna fold a lot because of the blinds. Um here my hand is the suitedness is not that important when our stack size is so small. I just want to have a lot of high cards here. Also he makes it 9x. 
probably just fold there. If he made it smaller, I could call, but, you know, a combination of his stack size and his extra large 3-bet was kind of uncomfortable. Uh, this hand's quite mediocre at 50 no limit. Neutral at a higher limit. Obviously, you know, 3-betting 6 high from out of position is never going to be, like, a slam dunk. Now I can start with a small bet and kind of evaluate. Easy fold on the turn. I mean, sometimes he's bluffing me with hands that actually dominate me. So, just gonna fold. If I had, like... You know, usually when you have, like, flush draws with, like, top pair, or, like, flush draws with, you know, a little bit more, you can you can keep calling there. Uh, with the intention, especially, of, of leading the turn there. Or leading the river when you complete your hand. King 2, pure a pure call. Never going to be three betting a middling hand like this. Uh, kings? I think king two is a fold, but other kings are going to be bets. Um, villain leads into me here. I'm just going to call and keep his bluffs in. He can occasionally have twos as the big blind. Okay, well, I'm pretty confident I have the best hand here. Uh, just gonna just gonna keep calling and evaluating street to street. Hard for him to have a three here. For value, obviously if he comes over the top. I'm gonna throw my hand away, but if I have a spade here. I'd probably overbet on table one. Just when Villain blocks the river, he just doesn't have a hand better than mine, so I can go for extremely thin value raise. Uh, you're going to check back. Probably going to call a lot of rivers, to be honest. Uh, I'd, def I'd like snap call this river, because Villain should just have a lot of floats here. Villain should have turned his hand into a bluff. I would have called with worse. But he, you know, villain can have just like unlimited back back doors that have whiffed there. So deuces kind of unblocks all of them. And so it becomes a really good call because you know when there's a million different floats on the flop and everything bricks, and villain, you know, called the flop and didn't really think about too long about raising me there. It's just unlikely he has trips when he sizes up in a bunch of spots. So. Uh, you know, when he pots it, he doesn't always have, like, queen x enough there. So, easy spot to be kind of overbluffed by the pool. Uh, Jack 2, definitely going to be a raise with the smaller stack in the small blind. And as you can imagine, you know, over these last two sessions, my red line is just soaring. Soaring red lines. That has a lot to do with my constant disrespect. Right? Really trying to range my opponents and understanding what their hands are so I can maximize the amount of dead money that they put into the pot and then fold it on a, a future street. That's something that I don't think we, we talk about enough. When we're kind of building our bluffing strategies. You know, the key is not to actually get them to fold on the earlier street. It's get them to call the earlier street or invest as much money on earlier streets as possible and then get them to fold down the road, right? That's that's really why we, you know, four bet so small when we're in position, right? Like, we're really incentivized to try to trick our opponents just to putting a little bit more money in. Probably a bunch of different strategies I can play here, but I'm going to start with a check for simplicity's sake. Not too much value in betting the turn here. Uh, probably not too much value on the river, so just check it down. Yeah, figured he'd have a jack, uh, jack X or, you know, sometimes worse by there, but no real reason to turn my hand to a bluff, nor that, nor do I think I was necessarily going to get it through after it goes check, 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 check. Uh, eight, nine facing an under-the-gun min raise is a 50-50 call 
at the higher rake structures and then uh, a pure call at like 1k or 2k. You know, pardon me again. I feel like my preflop play across every stakes, every stake is a little bit messy because like I'm always playing a combination of like high rake, low rake, timed rake. And so, right, like in a time rake game, facing a raise, I'm defending like 100% of my suited hands almost from every position. Uh, here on this board that is just like low and two and five favored, I'm just going to start with the range bet here. Uh, eight nine is not really allowed to actually just range bet there in that in that way, but I'm just gonna go ahead and do it here. Fortunately, the seven comes in. I'm obviously gonna have to call here and then donk if I hit a spade. I think that's that's pretty reasonable here. Easy game. I'm not sure if I not sure what sizing I could pick there. Um I'm gonna start with a check. Oh, villain super snap checks back the turn, so just get to automatically win. This is how easy the games are, guys. People are open folding. I've seen that live. Then a couple times where people defend the big blind, the flop comes like ace high and they just open fold. I'm like, wow. The problem with open folding is that it doesn't collect information. Even on a board that's like ace king or ace queen high, it's important to kind of see what your opponent does, right? Like, does he go for the very small strategy? Does he bet like 10% of the time? Or 10% sizing? Does he bet over bet? Right, you at least want those kind of like bare bones pieces of information. No weaker players here. Or, well, no, obviously weaker players. I'm sure if anyone cold calls me, they fall into the weaker player category, but... Like, if this guy calls, he's just bad, I assume. Although, you know, facing a 2.2, you know, you're theoretically allowed to call with hands here. Everyone calls. This guy just leads large. And I block a lot of his bluffs and stuff. Which is not going to put any money in. A little overbets here on the ace after he limps the button. Probably going to give our opponent credit for like two pair there. Or just ace jack that he limped. I think that, um, you know, something that's relatively important from recreational players is that they bluff. You know, I mean, when they bluff, I think 72 cards. But when they're value betting, they're often value betting quite tightly. And so when you're trying to hand read those players, you know, they're not going to show up with a lot of merges. They're not going to run a lot of like crazy like bottom pair into a bluff situations. So you get to just like kind of hand read them in a very, I guess, straightforward manner. So you can just say, oh, does the does the action in the board run out in such a way that his hand makes sense? Uh, and this really has to do with when you play against your opponents who are just like very equity driven rather than range driven. They're just gonna be like, oh, I have kings, I just go bet, bet, bet. Versus when you play against like a good player, they would be like, oh, I have kings. Uh, this board came really bad for me, so I should start by checking a huge part of my range. And then, oh, I, I bet the flop and then the turn was really bad for me. And so they just have just, you know, a little bit more balance, and they're just a little bit more difficult to play against. Uh, against a 4x here, I mean, just get to play mostly a 3-better fold strategy against those large sizings. And uh, against a 4x, usually, it's pretty indicative that they have strong hands. 
Like, you get to play extraordinarily tight um, against those large sizings, not only because you get to, like, overfold by an extra 10% in theory, but then you get to overfold even more in practice because they're just so, so, so uh, face-up in that spot as having a strong hand. Um, I don't even know if I should min-raise King-2 here against this guy. Because I'm just going to have to, like, always call. Hold. How does he... How does he do it? A6. The solver darling to... 3-bet here. Philip has also a gigantic stack. Very often when I see an opponent have a stack this size, I think that they're a weaker player. I have the ace of clubs here. The six has some relevance on the board, so definitely a hand that I can start with a bet. Just like infinite ways for me to improve. Three should have almost no interactivity on his end, so happy to keep firing. Easy game. Ace Queen is a four bet from the cutoff against a lot of three bets. Ace Queen offsuit being one of my favorite hands to four bet from every position. In earlier positions, it's a mix between four bet and folding. In later positions, it's going to be a, a pure four bet. You're going to open against what I suspect are two weaker players in the blinds here. I'm going to raise up sevens. Hopefully just get this heads up. But even if I don't and just like everyone calls, then, you know, this is like, this is going to be a really good situation too. I'm going to really small to start. And kind of just look at my opponents and evaluate from here. Easiest fold in the world. I don't like raising there too much. Even with the uh, 9x. Just get your opponents just fold too many hands. All right, set the trap. Keep my bluffs in. We hear player calls in position. Going to start with a check. Now I'm going to probe and then probably probe into another line. Uh, here I think it's just very unlikely that Villain has a strong hand when he picks this sizing. Um... Okay, well, I guess if we're going to get into the click click war, he has it. But uh, I think that that's not a bad opportunity to three bet there and then um, blast on a future street. Villain double over bets here after he... Oh, I'm, I think I accidentally put in a... A min raise there on the flop on accident. I think he like donked into me and I min raised him. Uh, here, a board. Or I want to have some checks. Actually, no, I'm probably just going to bet a lot here because I have a lot of double broadways. But, you know, in, in theory, at depth, right? want to play a little bit of more of a polar range and then, you know, checking back some of my least relevant flush draws is going to be quite useful for. Deception, making sure that I'm uncapped across, you know, various streets, etc.
The blinds really have not been 3-betting me much. Of course, now that I said that, small blinds going to 3-bet me. Um, but if they haven't been really 3-betting me, haven't been really 3-betting me much, probably nowhere near to the degree they need to be to be GTO. Really want to open up my ranges there. Probably open almost all suited hands. I mean, 7-2 suited probably is not that bad. Probably going down to like king, six offsuit, stuff like that. Might be might be profitable. I'm not thrilled that Villain starts with a large bet, but I have both the ace and the six, so I'm, I'm, I'm going to peel here. Um, I have no idea what Villain has here, but unless he pots it. I guess when he pots it on the four straight four flush here, He's going to have it. Especially after he checks back turn. I think that tells the tells the story pretty accurately there. It's like, oh, the four, the four straight came. I should check. Oh, the four flush came. Now I should pot it to make sure I maximize against the straight. Ace nine, a little bit on the loose side, but again, if my opponents are what I perceive to be much weaker than I am, then I want to be trying to open up very, very wide. Um. That's close. I think that sizing, I mean, if it was on not another board texture, wouldn't mind kind of trying to go crazy on him. Uh, and then when the small blind limps, just gonna close my eyes, raise any two. Not only do I think that this is gonna be immediately profitable, but then I can just close my eyes and just bet every, every flop. It has should you know has to be good against limpers. I mean, double barreling here with just any two cards is probably good, especially when you know I have a little bit of relevancy with the queen. I mean, not that he should have too much king queen, but You're just gonna just lean really hard on these guys with small sizings because you know they're not three betting, not three betting enough. Probably defending poorly against various sizings they're unfamiliar with. You know, I mean, when your opponent sizes up or down, even you know a small amount, you should be pretty mindful in changing your defending ranges by like five percent. And I just don't think that your opponents are really doing that. So you know, it's usually. When you're raising very small or very, raising very large, both pre or post flop, is when your opponents start to have, you know, kind of fuzzy areas in their defense. Because it does require a decent amount of study to understand uh, how you should be defending against all these different sizes. So here, just going to min raise into the weaker player. Here, probably should do the same. But, you know, 2.2, totally fine. All regs and then the weaker player, so even going to open queen 5 suited. Being super laggy here. Flop quite good for us. 
One snap min raises. I'm gonna play very clicky. Easy game. The importance of playing weaker hands. And then obviously, you know, when he has a hand that dominates me, it's very unlikely that I'm gonna, you know, punt to him there. When he, like, you know, check raises flop, bets turn, bets river, I'm just not likely to be calling him down. I was going to limp 3-4 into the weaker player again, right? Uh, don't really recommend a lot of limping, especially in the small blind and the higher rake structures, but I'm really willing to do whatever it takes to try to play a pot against some weaker players, whether that be opening queen-5 suited. You know, again, being a little bit mindful that all of the players behind me had full stacks, right? If you looked at a queen five suited and then everyone at the table is like 45 big blinds, that hands, you know, an auto fold. If everyone is pretty nitty and not three betting enough and then the big blind is bad, yeah, by all means. Remember, when you're here at zone, you're racing all of the other players to stack all of the fish. Right? You're not just playing your hand, you're trying to you're trying to beat beat the regulars to the money. I mean, you don't need to do it so much in this game because there's just so many really weak players, but... What? That line didn't make too much sense, unless he had exactly a gut shot or a slow play on the flop. As a generality, the rule is if you're wondering if you should call with bottom pair, more you should be calling more often than you think, and then when you have trips and you're thinking about folding, you should fold more often than you think. So is that a, a Yuri Pelagism? I think that might be the case. Um, I'm gonna play a large bet strategy. But you know. Without fail, when our opponents size up by the river, he has it. And that's just not the case when you get to different stakes, right? When players are trying to attack your capitedness. Dylan can't have uh, many to pair here with a six interaction. Can't have kings and jacks too often here, so I just get to bet large and then just keep putting in money. This card is not very good. Should actually improve a ton of villains. Um, hands to two pair. But still gives my opponent a lot of like pair plus gutter now. A lot of his gutters and, and like open end straight draws revolve around the queen. So I think I just have to check this hand down. I'm not thrilled about it. Oh, we got it straight on the turn. He should just bet the river himself. Make my life hard. And this is why I like donking myself, because villains check back all the time. Here we're gonna raise queen five against what I perceive to be the weaker lines. Um, 
my six and my diamonds here have a lot of interactivity, so this hand's going to bet, and this hand's probably going to bet more than I would if I had, like, nine, ten or something like that, or nine jack. I'll mix a lot. Uh, here. Just going to continue betting. So not making tons of hands and just coolering my opponents over and over, right? Not just like using huge value bets and sizes and just running people off the road with over bets, but rather a combination of spending a lot of time evaluating my opponents and trying to develop the maximum exploit strategy against their like sizing and timing. And that's really only something that you can do when you're two-tabling, right? I think that when we talk about why zone players often are struggling to have very high win rates, it, it really can't be from a lack of fish, right? I mean, just look around here. These games are just really, really plentiful with weak players. So it has to be a combination of, like, the timing and not being able to play the hands... Um, in the allotted time, and it has to do a lot with not being able to uh, spend a lot of you know time thinking about each hand or evaluating each each opponent like hand to hand very very clearly. Um, this hand probably wants to check raise. Block a lot of his continuing range here. He didn't pick two polar of a sizing on the flop. There we go. Really redlining him. <laughs> really redlining him. Not that that is the goal. The goal is to win the money. It just happens that when your opponents play with their hands very face up against you, that your red line should be exuberant. Should be celebratory. Um... I'm going to bet large with this 2 here, with the intention of turning it into a multi-street bluff on blanks. So here I can, you know, get my opponent to, like, call with a 4 or a 6 and then, you know, blasto him on a future street. Uh, here we're going to play a mixed strategy. I'm going to start with a bet here and probably overbet a lot of turns, depending on, on the turn. Um, I think I just get to float here, and then if he check goes check check, I bet like one third of the river. Like that's pretty reasonable. Um, I think this hand places a check raise now. Okay, kind of unfortunate that he raised the flop so thinly there. It's like a weird merge. Um, jacks with depth against the end of the gun. Definitely gonna be a call sometimes because of my three bet and four bet. Get face a four bet. I just hate everything. I'm gonna only gonna get one street of value. I block a ton of his, I guess, like, natural bluffs here. I'm just going to check, because, you know, having a hand like this maximizes him having some kind of, like, garbage hand or a hand that's just going to, like, bet twice. And now I have a hand that can, you know, call river. Fortunately, he does not bluff there. 
maybe could have thought about raising turn, but again, the properties of my hand were not, not fantastic there. So I was just trying to maximize against the bottom parts of his range. This is something I think is a generally underdeveloped skill, is that we spend a lot of time focusing early on in our career about how we maximize versus you know top end versus of, of range versus opponent's top end of range. Because those are the most memorable spots, making sure that you obviously put in the money correctly uh, at, at the top end of range is you know kind of a, a, an important skill because if you're doing that incorrectly, you just go bust out before you ever get to develop any of your other poker skills. Um, but as you get better, a lot of your kind of uh, study and inquiry comes from how do I maximize when my opponent has nothing and they recognize that they need to be bluffing in order to win some pots. And so, you know, as you move up in the stakes, a lot of your money comes from aggressive players who are worse than you, who, who can't tell that you are not as capped as you are in some spots, um, who are going to just, like, blindlessly try to run you off the road and, and have discovered, you know, through either coaching or experimentation that a lot of players can't beat, like, a pure bet, 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 bet strategy, right? Like, this was kind of a problem that people were running to in Limit Hold'em, is that, like, it's it, especially like in hits heads up limit play. Like I got away with just playing a strategy that always bet or raise post slot, and like a lot of people just couldn't beat that. They just were not able to like call enough on rivers that and win like one twentieth of the time. They'd still be able to find too many folds. Um, and so you just have to be really careful to make sure that your overall strategy does not succumb to a strategy that is just bet 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 so for here example you know i check back the flop i have to have a strategy that I can just go call call All right so and villain has a 10x here a lot but he also has a bunch of air I think that was a pretty good example of you know, our opponent's uh, bet sizing tells. You can usually name the hand that they have or air, right? Uh, well, it's just a flat against the under the gun 3x here. Just get really uncomfortable when a ton of money goes in. Go start with a call. I look into his timing, evaluate from here. Uh, half pot, unfortunately. I don't think I can fold, but I'm not thrilled. That's a pretty good river to actually slow down my opponent. Even when he has like ace-king or something like that. So it start, starts to get a little bit worrisome when jack-10 comes in. You know mediocre players are very very paranoid when like obvious front door draws come in five's always close but i generally think that these opponents are on the weaker end so happy to raise it up i probably missed an opportunity to four bet with my ace blocker there. I think people just don't squeeze to that sizing very often with a, a legitimate hand. Uh, facing the small sizing here. If the board was somehow like less coordinated here, like, and had spades or something like that, I could, I could think about calling. Um, such a horrible sizing. I think I'm just gonna fold this hand against this. I mean, like against a normal size three bet, this hand is, you know, a four bet or call candidate. But when he makes it like so many times bigger, I think I can just give him credit. I 
I mean, it feels bad, man, but I don't think any of my other options were fantastic. Ah, A6. A bit close to a raise when the pick blind is so bad. I'm not trying to bend over backwards to play a lot of a lot of pots with the really bad players. Again, you know, the more post slop reads that I have, the more lines that I think my opponents are going to be messing up. The deeper into the forest I can take them post slop, the more I don't really care about playing kind of junk hands. Even against the min format, ace queen super snapfold. Just a complete pure reverse implied odds hand. Um here at depth, this hand should be a check a tiny percentage of the time. Just on these trips boards. Uh, I think villain has a queen here a lot. I mean, I guess he has two pair here a lot. It's hard for him to have sets. I mean, he can have pocket sevens here, but he can't rejam, but I think I can just call there and wow. He min raised my big over bet there, which is kind of crazy. So glad I checked back that flop. All right? The you know, the reason you check back those ace ace high flops is because um, a lot of the times when you're a villain has a hand that has equity against you, it's drawing to a hand that you completely smoke. Um, yeah, I guess I just should fold without any diamond or inactivity with the six. Okay, I'm going to wrap up this session. Hopefully it was useful for you guys to see what it looks like to play kind of a full mixed strategy, playing only two tables so we can really, really zone in on our opponent's very specific tells and, you know, what kind of mistakes they're making. I don't think this three should be a turn that if villain had like kings or something he should be checking a lot. It's gonna, it's gonna merge here. I definitely can get value from like ace high ace high type hands here with the wheel. My hand obviously can call it call a raise too. If villain bet on the turn, because he picked a polar sizing on the flop, I probably would have raised on the turn there. Because then, my, you know, my three has a little bit less showdown value. Although, obviously, calling with the combo draw in position, obviously, it's, it's going to be always profitable. But again, when Bill goes polar, polar, I should look at my hand as, as I've improved five more outs more often than thinking that my hand is, has a lot of showdown value.